morning, everybody. Hymn number 457. 457. Let's go ahead and stand. Hymn 457. this morning. Oh, look at that. Trinity, first one up.
verse to remember when we're tempted to give people a piece of our mind. You know? Liberty. Summer, was that you growling? Oh, okay. <laughs> They're all pointing at you, Randy. I don't know. Summer. Jonas, Liam, sorry. Good job, buddy. Good job. All right. Christian. All right. Nehemiah.
dismissed. Sunday school. We get to the end of our series of lessons on the book of Jude. Last one. This will probably be a two-week lesson, I'm sure. It's a little bit longer one. But why don't you turn with me to the book of Jude. <clears throat> book of Jude starts out. Address to them that are sanctified by God, verse number 1, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. That would be what we would think of as a greeting, a greeting or an introduction. Letter starts off on a good note, and then it gives uh, the reminder that we need to earnestly contend for the faith in verse number 3 there, which was once delivered unto the saints. And then it goes on to uh, verse number 4, and all the way down to verse 19, and it talks about apostasy and apostate uh, people, people that have looked at the truth and rejected the truth. They have turned from it, uh, never having accepted it. These are people that choose rather to follow false teachings, false doctrines, and um, out there on the table uh, for you men for Father's Day, there's a uh, few of these left, but a book Pastor Shiflet wrote, we gave out last week, The Anatomy of Apostasy, and it identifies how apostasy creeps in. And one of the things I remember from reading the book was they change the words, they change um, the definitions of words. So it sounds like they're saying the right thing, but they're teaching something totally wrong. And um, <clears throat> we could talk on and on about that, different things, well, how things are being redefined today and stuff. And um, if you didn't hear the news, I'm sure you did, about the Supreme Court ruling coming down to preserve life. And uh, not as thorough as I'd like to see it be, um, but basically the gist I got is it's leaving it up to the states to decide instead of uh, the fed, federal government saying, this is constitutional, you must grant this. They're basically saying, we blew it 50 years ago. And um, so that allows states, and I, I was reading, uh, there's close to 20 states that already have laws in place to ban abortion or uh, significantly curtail abortion. Idaho is one of those states. And once again, um, probably not as thorough as I'd like to see it at all out ban, but uh, this is all a step in the right direction. And um, and I, I, I took a screenshot. Let me see if I can find it real quick. The uh, Mrs. Ed. Mrs. Ed um, you know who I'm talking about there, right? AOC. Um, the famous Mrs. AOC. Let me see if I can find it here. I don't know, but every time every time she opens her mouth on camera, I just think of, howdy, Wilbur. And uh, she said something so profound the other day. I took a screenshot of it, I thought, and maybe... Yeah, me and my tech, tech, a lot. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Representative Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. People will die because of Roe v. Wade decision. Excuse me, AOC, but your intelligence is really showing. People will not die. People will live because of that decision. She's trying to fear monger. She's trying to stoke the fires of rebellion. Her and uh, uh, hissy fit Elizabeth Warren. We're not going to stand for this. They're going to fly our brooms all over the country until this gets righted. You know, that's that type of stuff. They understand something. They have no concern. They they have more care. They have more care 
What is that um, little creature that was become so famous in the uh, um, the environmental movement? There was some particular uh, turtle or some a snail darter, a snail darter. Okay, a snail darter. They have more c concern over the snail darter. Um, they have more concern over little little animals, which are, yes, they're God's creation. They have more concern over saving the whales and saving the dolphins than they have over saving human life. They're so messed up. Without natural affection is what they are. That's what the Bible describes them, besides a lot of other terms. Um, <clears throat> but it's just indicative of the apostate movement, you know. It's so, so ridiculously absurd. We have a president claims to be a good Catholic and and yet supports abortion. And, you know, there was a big hullabaloo that uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi wasn't going to get to receive the mass because her ar archbishop or whoever he was, I can't remember what his, what his uh, rank was in the Catholic hierarchy, but he said we shouldn't be doing that because she supports abortion. Well, it's amazing to find one of those guys with a form of a spine, you know. So messed up in the day and age we live in. As we get to the end of the book of Jude, this hallway into the book of Revelation, talking about the last days, the apostasy that will prevail and things, <clears throat> we end this book. At the end of, the, at the end of this, we... Ended on a note of vic victory. You know, we are not the victims. We're the victors. God's people are victorious. One of the most tremendous truths that we must hold in this hour of awful wickedness is the fact that we are victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have read the end of the book and we win. All right? Sometimes that's hard to keep in focus and that's hard to keep in mind as we th see things coming apart and unraveling at the seams. <clears throat> it may seem like the wicked are winning, but yet God's people are on the victory side. Our Lord Jesus Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave. We are in him, and he is in us. You stop and think about it. What, what's the most they could threaten us with? Going to heaven early? Well, what if they torture us? Well, then we would just, you know, kind of uh, be slightly worthy of what the apostles experienced, what so many martyrs experienced. I'm not saying I would look forward to that. You know, that, sorry, i got to turn the volume down. Somebody's texting. Um. <coughs> But when we consider the fact that at the end of it all, we win. We have studied these apostates. We have looked at, and uh, the book here that is out there for you fellows, um, Brother Shiflet identifies some of them. Names a few names in there, if I recall correctly. It's been about three months, four months since I read the book. But um, these people that have departed from the truth. <clears throat> Look with me at these verses, 24 and 25 here. The Bible says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. God brings us back to the reality here. After spending so many uh, verses on the apostates, doesn't want to end the book on a discouraging note. But he says, unto him that is able. Aren't you glad he's able? Unto him that is able. 
We are.
Lord moved in some amazing ways. I'm sure in all my years of going to camp, I'm sure I probably saw a couple altars that were more full than any of the altar calls that we had at, at the camp here. Okay? But a full altar isn't always the result of... Uh, I mean, I, I've seen... I've seen emotional altar calls where, you know, things will happen and then you talk to people like a week later and they don't even remember why they went to the altar. Okay? But listen, what we saw in camp is lasting. The souls that were saved. And I hope that the decisions that were life-changing decisions. I, I heard about a young man who gave his life to Jesus Christ, got saved, and he talked to the person who dealt with him and said, I've been committing this sin, and when I get back home, I need to stop it and cut it off. Don't know, he's not from our church. I don't know what the rest of the story is in that one. But if that young man follows through with that decision, it will change the direction of his life. How does that come about? Because he is able. He is able, number one, to deliver. Look me to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. This is a great story in the Bible. Daniel in that foreign culture. A wicked worship system. <clears throat> Laws and mandates that went against God and the things of God, the teachings of the Word of God. Look at me to verse number 16. A law had been passed, actually verse number 11. Actually verse number 10, let's go to verse number 10. Sorry, I keep noticing some things here. Verse number 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, all right, they, they passed the mandate to flatten the curve, all right, he went into his house. Otherwise, this was the fact that he was unaware of the law and the, and the mandate from the king, the command. He knew it. He knew it was official. It had been signed. He went into his house. And his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Otherwise, this is the same thing that he had been doing before the mandate was signed, the proclamation. He, he just keeps everything status quo. He didn't hear it was signed and, signed and then say, oh, I'm going to go show them. I'm going to open my windows now. I'm going to prove a point. No, this is exactly what he'd been doing all along the way. And the reason why the mandate was constructed and put before the king and pushed and promoted was to catch him in this very act. Amen. That's the whole reason why they made this law. And he said, you know what? There's a law, so be it. I guess I'm going to be an outlaw. I'm going to follow God's laws before I follow man's law. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Who were the men who had assembled? The men who brought the law before the king for this very purpose. Once it was passed, when it was the sign, they're like, oh, now we have it. So they set themselves an appointment. We know what time he normally prays and does this. Three times a day, we're going to go find him. We're going to video him. Of course, he didn't have video back then. All right? We're going to document it. We're going to get witnesses. And they came. Sorry, then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed the decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, 
The thing is true, according to the loud law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, that Daniel. Otherwise, maybe there were some others named Daniel, but not that Daniel. All right? Which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he had heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. He knew he'd been set up. When they, when they were primping and prompting him to make this law, he felt they were stroking his ego and he fell right into their evil plot, and he knew that he had been had. He knew that he had been had. These lousy Democrats had passed this under cover of darkness. No. All right? He knew he'd been had. Displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver. Otherwise, he called his lawyers in, he called other politicians. How can we do something that I don't have to execute Daniel? All the way till the sun went down. Then these men assembled unto the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute with the king established may be changed. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel. I, I, for some reason, I just pick, I just picture. I picture one of these men that come um, in, in his robe and his Persian garb and, and, and Chuck Schumer's half glasses and a pointy <laughs> nose. Now we know how king, you know, and, and there's Jerry Nadler with his pants hiked up, you know, up to here, you know, beside him. And anyways, no. that type of people, same type of people. All right. And the king commanded, and they brought Daniel. Otherwise, they're, they're holding the king to the law. He has labored till the going down of the sun to get Daniel out of this. These guys, they come, they start pushing it. King commanded, they brought Daniel, cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake, said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Notice those words. Thy God whom thou servest continually. Continually. That was Daniel's testimony. He doesn't say the God that I serve every once in a while or that God that I service when it's convenient for you. Daniel had such a testimony that the king knew that this wasn't a show and that that God that he served and was faithful to that God he was banking on that God being faithful to his servant. And this man was a heathen with fake gods and a false hope. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the dead, and the king sealed it with his own signet, with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then a king arose very early. Otherwise, all night long, he's up. He didn't want to hear any music. He didn't want any midnight snacks brought in. He didn't want anybody to make a Taco Bell run for the fourth meal. All right? He spends a sleepless night. Why? Because he's worried if Daniel's God is going to be able to deliver him. The king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. When he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. He's worried sick. He's worried sick. He said to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? And said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. 
My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths, that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocent was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. I mean, they didn't find a scratch. They didn't find a lion, you know, saliva on him. Lions had been licking him. Why? Because the angel had shut the mouths of the lions. King Command, they brought those men which had accused Daniel to cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, and their wives, and the lions had the master of them and break all their bones in pieces wherever they came at the bottom of the den. I mean, they got down there and they, they threw them in there. And the Bible says they didn't even get to the floor. And, and the lions just ate them. Ate them. Just broke them up. Busted them up. They were down there playing political volleyball with them. Something. I mean, they, they didn't even hit the floor. And they were destroyed. Daniel's God, who is our God, is able to deliver. The king cried with that lamentable voice, Is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Yes, and he still is today. Look at me at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 8. 2 Corinthians 9, verse number 8. <clears throat> Not only is he able to deliver, but he's able to make grace abound. Chapter 9, verse number 8, 2 Corinthians. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. The ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. One of the big false teachings of, of Mormonism is that that grace is not available till the end when you've done everything that you can everything that you can to be a good follower of that religion alright everything you know you dressed you wore your suit on Sundays you have went and had your nose hairs waxed out and your ear hairs waxed out for the men you know, I, I still picture that. I can't, I, I'd have probably fallen off that barber chair laughing if I had witnessed that like Pastor Whitaker did. I can just picture Randy. It's a good thing Randy left the Mormon church. I mean, I just picture Randy there. Yeah, I never them, went that far anyway. Yeah, I didn't go that far. Get them, get them nose hairs. Big old Q-tips with wax. Stick them up. And that bring tears to your eyes in a hurry. So they follow all these protocols and, and things that the, the bishop tells them and the and a hierarch tells them they have to do. But they don't feel that the grace kicks in until the end. Right. And hopefully, they're not even confident they're going to get the grace. They still may land somewhere lower than where they want to land in the different levels that are out there in the land of make-believe. But I don't know what they do with this verse. They probably just twist it or contort it or ignore it. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. What the Bible is teaching us there is the grace of God helps us live the Christian life like we should. The grace of God helps us be the witness that we should. The grace of God helps us be a light in this darkening world. And God's able to make that grace abound, and He does make that grace abound. 
For whatever we face, God is able to give us grace. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 20. We'll just get there and we'll close with this and pick it up next week. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 20. <laughs> Bible says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. O our Lord is able to do exceeding abundantly. You know what it's saying there? That God wants to do some things that will just flat out blow our mind. Like we couldn't even dream it. We couldn't even dream it. You know what's something I think? I think from in talking to folks that were here at the time and in talking to Pastor Parrish, what he'll be able to see when he gets out here at the end of July there. It is maybe see a little bit of what he dreamed about. God's house being filled up. Okay. You know what I think too? Praise the Lord for that. But I think God wants to go beyond what any of us can think can happen here. You know what he wants to blow our mind? He wants to blow the community's mind. I was talking to somebody just recently. And I had a smile. I had a smile and uh, I guess, I guess, I don't know, he didn't say who said it. But I was talking to a fellow recently, and, and, he, and he said, yeah, there's talk around town about how, how foolish you people are for building another building. Really? Wow. Oh, we haven't even broken ground yet. <laughs> and I had to just smile. I had to smile. Praise the Lord inside. I was just like, yeah. And, and the reason why there's talk like that, they don't know our God. That's right. They don't know our God. You know what? There will always be Sam Ballots and Tobias, Yeshem the Arabians, trying to hinder and laugh and scoff and ridicule, ridicule the work of God. But he's able. Amen. Yeah. He's able. Father, thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for what you've done, and Lord, look forward to what you continue to do here. Father, I pray bless this service, bless those that are on their way to meet with us, and Lord, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts today. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen.